Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. I'm excited about this episode because I had a really insightful conversation about orphan wells and how the industry is working to address this issue with Jim Crompton, who's an industry expert and professor at my alma mater, the Colorado School of Mines. Jim retired from Chevron in 2013 after almost 37 years. He's the owner of Reflections Data Consulting, LLC, where he continues his work in the area of data management and analytics for the oil and gas industry. He's on the board of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Digital Energy Technology section and is a distinguished lecturer on the topic of putting the focus on data. He co-authored the book, The Future Belongs to the Digital Engineer with Dr. Dutch Holland. He's also a lecturer for top energy training, which is a great learning resource for inspectors, regulators, policymakers, and oil and gas professionals. It is an educational consortium that's composed of the Colorado School of Mines, Penn State University, and the University of Texas at Austin. They design and create online courses for oil and gas professionals focusing on the fundamental technology, science, and engineering of oil and gas operations. Since 2012, they have delivered more than 42,000 hours of content to professionals as part of their program for field inspectors and regulatory personnel. This is really important work that is helping educate regulators, inspectors, and policymakers so that they can develop informed public policy and regulations around complex issues in the oil and gas industry, like how to manage orphan wells. So without further ado, here is Jim Crompton with the Colorado School of Mines and Top Energy Training. Well, welcome, Jim, to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate the invitation. This uh important topic that you uh, you got for us to uh, have a conversation around. Absolutely. And I know it's something that's been in the news uh, lately, and we'll talk about that and, and what Jim's referring to is the issue of orphan wells and what is the industry going to do with these. And before we dive into all of that, Jim, I want to take a step back and just find out a little bit more about your background and your experience in the oil and gas industry. How did you decide to get involved in the industry? Well, I was a student back at uh, Colorado School of Mines in the mid-1970s, and I was uh, getting my master's degree in uh, geophysics, and I was a little bit more oriented towards um, earthquakes or earthquake seismology, that kind of area, but, you know, cold, hard economics. I found out the oil company paid a lot more money than the USGS did, so I, I kind of went where the, where the Payroll was a little bit uh, sweeter. And the, the, all of the seismology and all of the work that I had done it, within my college career, I guess, I adapted equally to reflection seismology. So I, that's where I entered the industry is, is using seismic data on the exploration side, trying to identify new exploration prospects. Very good. And so you worked in the industry for quite a while, I guess, after you got started and on that side, huh? 37 years career with Chevron, uh, kind of unique and hard to do these days. But I had a lot of different jobs and a lot of different places, but one employer. And so that was very good experience to work for a large international oil company, get to see different aspects of the industry around the world. And uh, well, they treated me real well. So uh, I retired in 2013. We moved back to Colorado from uh, Texas, where I I'd spent the last, I guess, 15 years or so with Chevron. And then I started a little consulting business just to keep me busy. And then about four years ago, I was asked to uh, help develop a course at Colorado School of Mines in their petroleum engineering department for their data analytics minor. So I was uh, kind of recruited by the department head, Dr. Ramona Graves, and um, she asked me to develop this course and teach this course which I've done for the last four years now. I've got my largest class ever in those four years this semester, so it looks like there's some interest in it. And then we've also added to that some online courses in a, a graduate certificate program. There's a number of these on campus, and the one in petroleum data analytics is the one that I, I guess I've contributed a, two of the four courses to the 
to the certificate program. That's very interesting. I know that data is becoming more and more important within the oil and gas industry. It seems like it's taken us a while compared to other industries to sort of treat data as an asset and to understand, you know, with the volume of data that engineers have to analyze how to do a better job of managing that to make sure they're making good decisions. The last part of my corporate career within Shell actually was in the enterprise architecture team. So you're mentioning data and all of that brings back some fond memories of, of looking at that and looking at how, at least within Shell, that was managed and how all of that worked together to make sure engineers spent the time analyzing data, making decisions instead of having to go and search for information and data. So that's good to hear that there's a analytics program at Mines. I know that's a, a huge part of the industry now. And actually, I was even the supervisor in charge of an enterprise architecture group at Chevron for a while. So there's a there's a connection. But I mean, engineers and geoscientists have always analyzed data. I mean, that's from the start. But I agree with you that other areas totally outside our industry kind of caught on to the big data, advanced analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all those things you want to talk about, probably a little later than most. And it's hit different parts of our industry faster than others. I always consider geophysics as the first digital discipline because all we had was, you know, the seismic data. But petrophysics, uh, the reservoir characterization, the uh, advanced drilling techniques, uh, now maybe production operation maintenance is one of the latter disciplines to really catch the big data bug. But it's pretty much everywhere now. Absolutely. So so talking about data, I know that you know a little bit about orphan wells, and so I wanted to pick your brain about that today. Before we dive into the details and kind of understanding, you know, the data and the issues associated with orphan wells, just for our listeners that may not be familiar with the term, what exactly is an orphan well? Well, an orphan well is um, essentially a well that's reached its economic life. It's no longer producing oil and gas. But what makes it, I guess, a unique category is that its ownership is unknown. Maybe the last operator that uh, had a uh, connection with the well has gone bankrupt, gone out of business, whatever it is. But for purposes of financial accountability, there's no one on the books to uh, pick up the tab. And obviously, when there's no operator to be found, then obviously that goes back to the state or the federal uh, agencies, whoever, you know, own a mineral lease, and they have uh, the responsibility then for all of this list of abandoned, no longer producing, unknown ownership, uh, that all kind of equals orphan. And how big is this issue? I mean, are there just a few of these or are there, you know, thousands of these across the country? The last official count in the U.S., was about 135,000. That number probably is far too small. Uh, when you begin to look at states that had oil and gas activity that began in the mid to late 19th century, we only really started to have oil and gas commissions in the early 20th century. So there was two, three, as many as four decades of the industry where the operator didn't have anyone to to tell about or ask for a permit or, or register their well with a, a database. So you've got a kind of the real unknown part of this number. Everybody wants a number. But, uh, you know, if you want a number, it's 133,000. If you want to you know the reality, it's probably several times bigger than that. But most of those are in the states where, you know, that early oil and gas production started. Pennsylvania has got, you know, uh, in 1859, Colorado, 1862, the, these are the first wells. California was in the 1860s, Texas in the 1890s. So uh, all of these states, operators are drilling a lot of wells before there was even, you know, a, a state or a federal organization to keep track of them. So that's the unknown part. And so, and now most of these are shallow wells, you know, Pennsylvania might be a hundred foot well down to a coal seam or something like that. But, you know, they're not all significant, the same kind of deep wells or anything like that. But 
Uh, there's a lot of those that came before, say, the 1920s or 30s when they started keeping track. But there was a large number that are really unknown, and, and they really don't show up on anybody's books. So the, there's this large number of kind of unknown abandoned wells, and certainly there's no company that goes history all the way back into that era. So uh, all these wells that came before are really uh, more regulated attempts to keep track of everything uh, in the 1920s or so. Those are the unknown numbers that, you know, if you can find them, and occasionally we do, there's a problem with them, uh, that have to go back to um, the books, and we don't know what those numbers are. When I first had a chance to talk to uh, a group that the top corp puts together, it's a group of oil and gas regulators, field inspectors, office permit agents, things like that. You know, I was talking about advanced emerging digital technology, and they were saying, yeah, but their day job is looking after these abandoned wells. They get a phone call from a, a surface owner who said, you know, there's salt water coming out of this well, or maybe there's some methane gas coming out of this well, bubbling thing. And they have to go try to do this detective story of, do we know who owns it? And so their real world, which, you know, I was really interesting to listen to their perspective, was of this around responding to public comments about these abandoned orphan wells. And, you know, all the cool stuff that we, we can kind of teach about the digital oil field, you know, the reality is, you know, we're going back here and trying to deal with this history. Well, that's a big issue. You know, it, it depends on, I guess, how much it costs to actually plug and abandon these wells. Obviously, like you said, if it's one of the shallower, you know, 100 foot wells in Pennsylvania, it's probably not going to cost as much as a deep, deep well somewhere else. But, you know, if you're conservative and say maybe thirty to $100,000 per well, that uh, three dollars or 135000 number, you're talking uh, billions of dollars that it would cost to actually go through and, and uh, P&A these wells. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I don't know. That's true. The number can add up pretty quickly. But again, everybody says there's no average orphan wealth. They're all kind of have very unique kind of characteristics. So the abandonment cost could be from a few thousand to a few hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, depending on, you know, lots of the different attributes about the well. Chasing them all down, paying for someone to properly abandon. Since the 1970s, we have a very rigorous approach to say how to abandon a well. And so anything abandoned in the last, say, 40, 50 years with uh, proper cement techniques and, you know, a, a, a Halliburton crew or one of the oil field service crews that have, have gone out there and done that has you have little to worry about in terms of emissions or subsidence or water, you know, exposure, the rest of that. But, you know, there's 3 million wells drilled in, in the United States. And, you know, it's how many of those were drilled before the 1970s. You know, when 1950s, we started with a, a process to abandon wells with cement. But it took another 20 years or so to really get the displacement technique in, in place and, and know really how to put the cement in there and, and, and take care of uh, cleaning out the well, taking the tubings out and the rest of that. So it, it really is our long forgotten history that's starting to catch up with us. Now, the, one of the reasons why it's a big topic today, as part of the 2021 infrastructure bill that passed um, the Congress, there was a large sum of money, $4.7 billion with a B, uh, that was essentially granted towards this problem of properly abandoning wells. Now, just recently, about $1.15 billion of that money was allocated to 26 different states to help them with their budgeting problem. You know, most of the states I've talked to, they, they have a, a register of the wells they know have not been properly abandoned. Now, that number is probably conservative, uh, but these are the wells they're keeping track of and inspecting. And occasionally when they're a problem, they have a budget in order to properly abandon them. But just about every state doesn't have enough money. So they were very appreciative when this federal grant uh, started coming down to them. And, and now they can trickle down and look at their priority list and hire contractors and kind of get after the inventory some because there's this big boost of money that the, the feds have put into the system. Well, it's good to hear. I know that 
you know, like you said, with a lot of these companies going bankrupt, there's, you know, unless somebody steps forward, whether it's becomes a profitable venture to actually go and, and do this work, or we'll talk a little bit about some of the nonprofit organizations that are trying to tackle this or help with this issue. But one of the things that I always find interesting is the the bonding requirements with the state regulators. And like you said, a lot of these wells were drilled before these requirements were put in place. But let's say a well um, gets drilled today. You know, what is in place to prevent if that well, once it stops producing from becoming an orphan well, that surety bond that the operator has to to put up, is that sufficient to to plug the wells that they operate or kind of how do the, the state bonding requirements cover these types of wells? Well, a lot of that has to do with um, essentially the credit worthiness of the operator. Where there's, and of course, every state's a little bit differently. So I'll, I'll, let me give you a, a bit of a perspective from Colorado, where I'm kind of living. And that's one of the states like California and others who have kind of the, the more strict regulations. But uh, permit now requires. Well, first of all, a proof of economic viability that you'll be there when the well finally stopped producing and that you can pay the um, the bill to P&A it. Uh, P&A, plug and abandon, I, I might use that term often. And even now in, in some of the permits there, uh, this would be in the DJ Basin north of Denver, between Denver and Greeley, if you know that geography. The tendencies of the large operators, let me kind of divide this in classes. The tendency of the large operators, you know, obviously a Chevron or a Shell or a Occidental or, or something like that, probably the state doesn't worry too much about that. They won't be there to plug and abandon it. They're even going in to get a permit on this new super pad sort of concepts where they're going to put 12, 16, uh, 18 wells on a just one single pad. They will go in there with a longer term plan and they will not only pl- obviously make some sort of economic guarantee that they'll be there, but they'll go and, and properly plug and abandon a lot of these orphan wells that may be on the lease, even by previous operators. They'll do that as part of their permit to operate. So they're paying up front and paying extra in order to try to clean up the issues. Because DJ Basin, there were a lot of vertical wells that were in these areas that going back you know, to the 50s and 60s. So they will clean up that and then they will do the other and then they'll post their economic um, status. And of course, if you're a big uh, deep pockets company, a big oil and gas operator, it, you're not so much in the bonding requirements. But if you're the next tier, the smaller operators, that's when the state will uh, look at this issue of posting a surety bond. Essentially, just in case you're not there when the well needs P&A, that you will have posted a bond with a third party that if you're not around, the state can go to that bondholder and get some money in order to take it, you know, to to pay for it itself. Now, you ask the question, are the bonds sufficient? Mm -hmm. Uh, The answer in most cases is no. The states historically have not really collected enough money. It was kind of thing that, you know, you drill 10 wells and they may collect the bond to, it's kind of a probability game to, um, Say I got enough money to to plug one, uh, so this is an area that states are now looking at because what they're finding again they go first of all they try to find the operator of record and, and put it back on them to pay. Second of all, if they can't find that, is there bond money out there in order to try to pay? And then the third would be you know most of these oil and gas commissions have a budget of sorts that uh, that could be used to deal with. Uh, specific problem wells, maybe one that's close to a navigable uh, river or something like that. They don't want the salty water, you know, escaping to that. Those will get you the high priority on, on the state's list. But they're fighting again, uh, there's not enough money, which is why this federal grant was uh, was kind of put in there because everybody's fighting themselves short. Now, some states are a lot more active. Texas is one of the most active States, as I go around this, they have a very active program in plugging wells, be a bit richer budget, more uh, deliberate program. And, you know, but part of it you go back to is, you know, the, fir- the first call go- goes to the office and then the field inspector goes out there and tries to see what's going on. Is it a small subsidence problem where kind of the wellhead is kind of caved in on itself? I mean, that's a real hazard if you're a rancher and you've got cattle that could fall into the hole. So that's an issue to the rancher for sure. 
uh, or it might be one that there's a salty water, you know, kind of dri- coming out of it. It maybe small volumes. Uh, it's a mess, but it's not probably a huge safety hazard. But then I, I just saw something on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. There was this big well in Crane County, Texas, West Texas, that, you know, there was a hundred foot high geyser that was persistent for, for weeks on the, on this old well that people had kind of forgotten. Mm-hmm. Well, they, they did their detective work. They find out it was an old Gulf well in the 1950s. And then all of a sudden that Chevron gets a call and Chevron accepts the liability and goes out there and, and pays the bill to, to plug the well. But often they, you know, one of these things, they look it up and the answer is, well, we have no records of this. We don't know. And it, it kind of gets to the end of the thing of uh, where do we find the money in order to try to deal with it? It was kind of funny uh, in a way. The number of wells that the states had on their register grew dramatically when this federal money came out. <laughs> so all of a sudden, because every, you know, all these 26 states wanted some piece of the pie. And uh, so all of a sudden they reached down and did a little bit more homework and and their numbers grew a lot and because so, they wanted, uh, you know, some of that federal money. But I mean, it's legitimate. I mean, there's no real, I guess, purpose in, in going out and finding all the wells unless they're a problem. And all of this history, unless it's a problem, which is one of the areas of research that you know, that is, can we figure out from some remote sensing, uh, this is kind of the technology, airborne survey, drone survey, satellites, a little low resolution for this, but can we find a way to um, identify where these wells are and deal with them maybe in not one at a time, but, you know, maybe a group have some more efficiency in, in the PNA kind of work. And of course, if there's metal in the in the well bore, then magnetometer surveys from a drone can can help pick out anomalies. Graduate students are a great source of low cost labor to go around into an area to try to find uh, you know where some of these off the record books wells are. But uh, again, you go back in the 1870s, 1880s in Pennsylvania, they drilled them with wooden tubulars, so there's no metal in there to go try to find. So it's still very labor intensive. And um, everyone's trying to do risk reward, you know, kind of approaches on this and deal with the the nastiest issues first. And those those nasty issues are the ones that not only will include safety, which is number one, two, salt water. uh, And probably number three is some of these wells may even be producing some methane from the, the reservoir source. And that's a methane emissions, greenhouse gas kind of issue. But the the end of the game is, do, do we really know where all this stuff is? And the answer is no. And more often than not, we trip over them figuratively as well as literally uh, as people are going about their business. And and then that adds to the to the long list of things we have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like at least there's progress being made in technology that we have today that will allow us to identify some of these. Can you talk a little bit about some of the research that's going on at uh, universities to study both like maybe detection and doing surveys to try to identify these orphan wells or to look at, you know, cementing optimization, different P&A techniques to try to bring the cost down and but then still get an effective uh, way to plug and abandon these orphan wells? Do you know of any of that stuff going on? Well, I- Yes. And I think even though there's a lot of universities are also reaching out to say that, you know, can the government fund some new research in this area? I think, you know, number one is identification. Where are these things? And, um, you know, in some of that and trying to do it in a, again, a, if you're going to talk about a cost effective way, you would, you're trying to say, well, what can I see from the air? What can I see from a drone or an airplane? And that will be able to somehow identify these things. The California has got a big problem. And that, I mean, the Los Angeles Basin, most people don't really realize, was one of the most prolific oil and gas basins in the in the United States. And from the 1860s through the 1950s, there was many, many large fields found in Los Angeles. But essentially, with the growth of the urban population in L.A. and after World War II, essentially, most of these oil fields just got paved over, literally paved over with roads and and buildings and contracts with them. One of the first wells in the LA basin that discovered one of the first large fields is under the Dodger Field. I mean, at downtown LA. So they're they're all over uh, the Los Angeles basin, and trying to find those is is, is even more difficult. Um, 
I mean, every basin's got their problems. Pennsylvania, heavily wooded, rural, ranching, you know, and where are these small old wells? California, you've got you got wells essentially almost coming up underneath the pavement and sometimes that they will have emissions and then you go try to find them. And, you know, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, we all have, you know, issues that if you're in a rural area, ranching, farming, um, of course, farming will disturb the surface so that you can't find subsidence is easy. But problem number one is how to find them. And then Problem number two is probably right now, obviously, with the uh, climate change issues, uh, are they emitting methane or something that, you know, we don't want to get into the air? So do we know that number? No. I mean, because we're, we're not measuring. There's no sensors on these well bores. We don't know where they are, right? So the best we are doing is from satellite basin-wide uh, emissions estimates, which you can do. And they're saying, you know, there are some quote unquote, super emitters from some of these abandoned wells that are, are problematic. And the satellites are getting higher, higher resolution. That's an area of research. And to be able to get down and point to a facility, maybe. And with that, that's a real data analytics challenge. And that's one of the ones we're doing here at Colorado School of Mines is we're working on the satellite imaging, the airplane imaging, the continuous monitoring that sometimes goes on. And then you've got geospatial and time series analytics, really cool you know, kind of stuff that graduate students can get degrees with. And they're trying to, first of all, identify, locate, and then quantify where some of these emissions are. And then obviously, if they are a problem, then they become something to go fix. I think there is some work on how to plug and abandon a well. Most of the plug and abandon technologies hasn't changed since the 70s, although we've improved how we put cement into the ground in terms of isolating all of the geologic formations that produce fluid, isolating the freshwater aquifers from the deeper hydrocarbon uh, reservoir sources. You know, those are topics that we're looking at in terms of how to do it. Um, but again, there is kind of a lack of economic incentive. And I, you kind of talked about profitability. You know, this is kind of nobody makes money except maybe the contractor who gets the job to P&A it. Uh, it's a cost to the operator. It's a cost to the state. It's a cost to the industry. I mean, if you're in the 1940s and you P&A a well according to what EPA said you should do, I mean, you were compliant. You did what the, you know the law said. The fact that that thing didn't hold for 30 or 40 years is, I mean, is that, I mean, it's a historical look back sort of mistake, but I can't be too critical of the industry doing what it was supposed to at the time. Uh, and companies that have to go bankrupt in, in the rest of that and can't pay their bills. I mean, that's an issue, obviously, the industry kind of gets a black eye from. But uh, it, we're trying to deal with it now. We're trying to find them. We've got some federal money that uh, it's both federal grants to the state to deal with their problem, federal grants to their own uh, agencies to deal with their problem. You know, the Forestry Service, the Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, all of these organizations essentially have a role in the responsibility that there's some of these orphan wells that are sitting on their land. So, you know, it sounds like there's some progress being made. Let's talk a little bit about the details around, you know, when a service company shows up to abandon one of these orphan wells, what are the steps that they take? You know, how does it work? And then, you know, how long does it take? You know, is this something that takes just a couple of days, weeks, months? Are we talking? So just to give a feel for if you're a surface owner, you have one of these wells, maybe it's been identified. They're going to come do something about it. What are they going to actually do on your uh, property? Well, again, it kind of depends on the well type, how deep it is, all the rest of that. But there are specially kind of abandonment rigs. That's kind of like a drilling rig, except it's much smaller in a sense. Essentially, it's just one. The The job is to clean out the well and then put cement in, in the right places in the well. And a, a deep well that could be 10,000 feet deep, I mean, it, you probably would take a couple of weeks that you would have a number of zones that needs to be isolated. So you, you bring out this uh, the dry cement and then you mix it on site. There's There's equipment that has to do that. There's the displacement equipment that's going to inject the, the cement in all the right places. And, it, it, you know, days to weeks for sure. You know, and that's assuming that you can get access to the site easily. 
Uh, some of these wells may be in a difficult place. I, I read some stories here where some of these wells were on a, a popular beach in Southern California, and they were starting to be problems, and they were kind of right at the uh, tidal line. And of course, dealing with all of that stuff is tremendously more expensive. And you may be dealing with a problem that takes months to solve. Most of it just is getting access, you know, to the to the material. Of course, that time is money, so the those that take a lot longer cost a lot more. But essentially, you know, it's a fairly efficient job. I mean, if the access is easy to do, there's a very robust industry and a lot of contractors out there that'll will take this work. Uh, there are some, as as you kind of talked about before, that are kind of nonprofits that are going out there and trying to, you know, find some of these. There's a, there's a big one in uh, Pennsylvania that's doing a lot of great work. And, you know, those are cheaper, smaller, easier to deal with sort of wells. And, uh, but all of them need, uh, you know, kind of this remediation as they go forward. So it's going to take a lot of players. A lot of it's driven by, do you have the money? I mean, the, the contractors aren't the nonprofits. They're the ones that, you know, they'll, you'll get a bill and they know how to do it and they ought to do it well. And they've got the equipment and the crews and that um, everything is ready to go, but, you know, they need a contract. Yeah, it makes sense. So another question I think people might have is if you have a well that's on your property and it stops producing, they shut it in, you know, there is a time period that elapses and, you know, if nothing's happening there in general, and I know it varies by state, by jurisdiction, but how long does a well have to be shut in? Before an operator has to P&A the well, you know, again, assuming they're not planning to produce in the future, it's not some maintenance issue or mechanical issue that they have to fix to bring the well back on production. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, that's um, an issue that gets more complicated than you, you think, uh, because a lot of wells are what's called T&A versus P&A. So T&A is temporarily abandoned. Uh, it has reached its economic life. But the operator hasn't really said, I'm, I'm going to call it quits on this well. They may be saving it for uh, a later, you know, go back and it's called refracking. Uh, they could go back and do a well and uh, that is probably long since abandoned and they may revitalize it. They may have a new completion technology. So a lot of operators, say you've got a lease and you have 10 wells on it and a couple of the wells have stopped producing. And so you will not. P and A them. You will not notify the state that this is a well that's permanently abandoned. Because if you if you send in that notice, you need to to take care of it to to do the abandonment work. But if you temporarily abandon it or just change the status within your filing to the state, then you don't have to really do much about it until essentially you surrender the lease, and that might be the very last producing well could take years. I mean, it's not it's not days or weeks after uh, it, it's TNA. It could be years until the lease is abandoned, and then you're required to clean up everything on the lease. So some operators, it all depends on their strategy in terms of the produce, how much they think there might be a, a reason for them to reenter the well at some later date and do something uh, that could be used as an injection well instead mm -hmm. of refrack and uh, make it a new producer, or it could be Redrill, you know, a shallower producing horizon. There's a lot of really good economic reasons and operation reasons to T and A a well. But um, you know, if you're a surface owner, you're wondering, you know, I'm not getting any royalty. That well is sitting over there; it's not doing anything. Why don't they take care of it? Well, it, it's probably because it's in this kind of gray category of, of temporarily abandoning a well. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a complicated issue. Unfortunately, I know that there's no easy answer. So I guess if you're in this boat, if you have minerals or if you're a surface owner, certainly contacting the operator, finding out what their plans are would probably be the the way you could find out what's going to happen next and uh, and go from there. Without a doubt, uh, be in touch with the operator. You know, if, it, if you've got an active lease, ask them. If you don't know who the operator is, say it's been sold or and that, that's one of the problems now. These wells are bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold. And in a 10-year period of time, they may have four owners, right? So mm -hmm. um, just even keeping track of that it sometimes isn't straightforward. But if you don't know who it is and it's causing a problem and it's, you know, salt water is coming out or doing something like that, you got to contact the state. And um, you should uh, be proactive in terms of uh, 
letting the state know that there's an issue, having the field inspector come out and check out the area, because if he does that, he'll file a report and it'll get on the, on the state's list. And most states, they have pretty good databases and they don't forget those kind of wells. I'll forget the ones that, that happened 100 years ago, but not the ones you, you just called about. And those will, um, you can put pressure and leverage in order to try to get something done that way. Yeah, that's a great point. So you mentioned the emissions from these wells and you know some of these can be a concern from a greenhouse gas standpoint. And certainly, you know, you, you mentioned the issue of, you know, subsidence or, you know, there's some cattle you're farming and there's a, a wellhead in the way. I grew up on a ranch, so I, I'm sympathetic to the cattlemen. Yeah, yeah. And so there's an issue. Obviously, that's an issue from a surface owner point of view. But then, you know, talking about those environmental concerns, you know, how big of an issue is, are the methane emissions from orphan wells? We have a general sense for kind of the, the magnitude of this. Well, I think it you know, the, the short answer is, I don't think we know hmm. because we're not trying to measure it. So, you know, to say it's X number of, uh, you know, megatons of carbon into the air is, is kind of just a guess. Um, I'm to the point of saying, I think we need to measure. We can't improve anything unless we measure it. There are some encouraging signs uh, where companies, um, just one in particular, that's a Colorado-based company called Project Canary that does continuous monitoring, they are starting to have some um, more innovative contracts, say with pipelines or with an operator in a, in a large area, that they'll go out there and put out a grid and they'll begin to measure uh, in a field kind of basis. But if you've got three or four or five of these sensors out there and you can detect an emission through triangulation and other statistical techniques, you can at least get close. And if you can get close, you can have some sort of sampling, whether it's a thermal cam imaging camera or gas sampling technologies, you can go out and figure out if it is a problem. I think, you know, the ones that are more problematic are the ones where it was an oil well to start out with, and it had a little bit of natural gas in it. And, you know, all of these orphan wells, essentially the reservoir pressure is died. It's a dead reservoir. I mean, there's not enough energy within the reservoir to lift the fluid to the surface, even though there's still fluid down there or hydrocarbon reserves. Uh, it doesn't do that. But these dead reservoirs can reach what's called a bubble point uh, where just like shake up your caffeinated drink and the, and the CO2 comes out of the liquid, right? I mean, it, it reaches a bubble point and all of a sudden it degasses and the gas comes out, the liquids stay there. And that degassing of that methane from what's largely an abandoned old oil well uh, essentially, I think are some of the more problematic ones. And in that, the you know, I think a lot of the studies that pe people have done is all these things aren't normally distributed. Most wells are fine. Most wells aren't doing anything. They're dead and the, whatever temporary abandonment was put on is adequate. Uh, so most of these wells, no one really needs to worry about that much unless there's subsidence or something that's that's causing it. But there are a, a tail end of these super emitters that are probably significant to worry about, and we need mm -hmm. to know where they are. And I think that's this area where I know in School of Mines we're interested and others are interested. University of Texas at Austin's got a program in the Permian Basin. Uh, we're interested in trying to find those wells that are the few, the kind of abnormal super emitters that are kind of invisible to our measurement techniques. Um, methane is invisible. I mean, you can walk right by one. It's odorless, it's colorless. You you can't tell unless it's maybe bubbling up in salt water or something. But don't put a flame next to it. <laughs> You'll find out real quick if it's methane. Don't do that. Um, but, you know, it's these things we don't know, we don't know. And uh, I think we, we need to measure. We need to find a way of finding those small but significant orphans that are out there causing trouble. Yeah. And it makes sense that, you know, some of these more advanced monitoring and the sensors and things like that. I know that there was a recent uh, survey done in the DJ basin where they looked at methane emissions across the entire basin to try to pinpoint to your point, uh, you know, these super emitters, what are the big sources of, of methane emissions? And I think some of the interesting takeaways from that was that, 
the oil and gas industry wasn't the biggest emitter. There were certainly other categories that were higher. And also you have the issue if you're using, if you have like an active field that you're grazing cattle, well, they could mask that orphan well if it's emitting methane because the cattle are actually probably going to produce a bigger footprint. And so that could be confused uh, when you look at that higher level data. So yeah, it's a tough challenge, but I know that we have some smart people working on it. So hopefully they'll figure out some ways to try to pinpoint some of these uh, larger emitters. Yeah, Weld County in Colorado is an interesting example. It it has most of the production from the Niobrara and the DJ Basin, but it's also probably Colorado's largest agricultural economy. And there's feedlots and there's everything. So is it the cow belching? Is it the landfill degassing? Is it the methane of, of a well leaking and fugitive emissions? The answer is it could be any of those. And and you, uh, it's a, sometimes a little difficult to figure out which is which and kind of assign ownership of who has to fix things. But um, mm-hmm. um, you're right. Most of the estimates say that the uh, methane emissions from oil and gas is about a third of what the total. And of course, it might be more or less depending on what other sources are. But agricultural is a, is a good third and, and landfills and the rest and, and wetlands or things like that are almost the other third. So we are working and everybody is putting the attention on the oil and gas industry and it it's mm-hmm. only a third of the problem, but it probably gets 95% of the attention. Yeah, that's a great point because, you know, certainly at the end of the day, methane's methane and whether, you know, whatever the source is, you know, it should be dealt with, you know, either way. So hopefully some of the data and having better data will help highlight the disparity in, in attention and maybe we'll get some more focus on the, the larger sources, regardless of who, who it is or, you know, what industry or what they're doing, but, you know, just look at it objectively. So I think that would be a good thing if that, if, if anything comes out of more of a focus on, on monitoring and, and, and better data. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm involved in an SBE Society of Petroleum Engineers work group whose title is just measure what matters. And it's mm-hmm. a, it's a combination of the data science technical section, as well as the sustainability technical section with regard to these things. And and that's the theme of what we're doing at Colorado School of Mines or the Payne Institute of Public Policy. You know, with the, the theme here is responsible gas. You know, keep the molecules in the pipeline and, and send them on down the, the road and not leak. So we're trying to do that same thing, measure what matters. Yeah. And, and as far as measurement goes, can you talk about some of the measurement and the monitoring that's done with these orphan wells once they've been identified? Do regulators require any sort of monitoring before they go in and, and PNA the well and afterwards to make sure that it was done correctly? Can you talk about what type of data is collected throughout that process? Well, this is the area of quite a bit of change right now. Uh, many states, Colorado may be at the forefront, but uh, New Mexico and is following pretty close along the lines are, are rewriting the regulations. And the regulations are now moving from estimating your emissions to measuring. Uh, And there's targets at state levels, federal levels, company levels to reduce the methane emissions. A lot of talk about a metric called methane intensity, which is essentially how much is leaked divided by how much you produced. And the large operators have committed to reducing that ratio significantly, and they're making big progress. Um, But the, the... the unknown right now. I mean, the fact that we're going to begin to measure more is given, uh, and that's that's been baked into laws. It's been baked into uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, pronouncements. But now you get down to writing regulations that uh, where you have to follow the law or make the bring the law into action, and we really don't know how. I mean, so regulators are sitting there and they're they don't know the right technologies to say you need to do this, this, and this. Uh, like they did before. For 50 years, well, not quite, 30 years, we've been living with a an estimation formula that came from the Environmental Protection Agency called Quad OA that, um, that told us how to estimate our emissions. And everybody followed that. Now we're saying that's not good enough. We're saying we need to measure. And so their conversations are with industry and regulators about how, the, the critical question of how to measure. And there's uh, choices. There's pros and cons. We call this the digital canopy. But uh, uh, there's pros and cons of satellite work that can help you. It's cheap. It's 
uh, covers large areas. It, uh, I mean, it's cheap once someone else launched the satellite. The um, Environmental Defense Fund is launching a satellite soon that costs them $100 million. So, I mean, the satellites aren't cheap, but it will really bring higher resolution to methane monitoring from a satellite. So, but there's pros and cons with that. There's pros and cons with aerial surveys, pros and cons of drone surveys, like the one you mentioned that that happened in Colorado here recently. There's pros and cons of continuous monitoring. It's probably the most accurate, but maybe more expensive. Uh, there's pros and cons of just what the operator does and what they call their LDAR processes, leak detection and repair. Uh, and that usually is a human being walking around with a thermal camera, the FLIR, forward looking infrared camera, uh, in order to really specify which valve is leaking, right? You get down to the the real nitty gritty with Eldar, but it's the most expensive. So within this canopy of options of measurement, we're trying to find the sweet spot. I mean, I know that, and and this is an area of a lot of experimentation and we're doing more with uh, the aircraft flyovers. We're doing more with the drone surveys. We're doing more with the continuous monitoring. We're doing, the satellites are really up in their game in terms of what they're being able to measure. But Trying to find what is the right way to measure, particularly expanding to orphan well areas that might be just in the same part of the basin you're producing, or maybe a part of the basin long abandoned. You know, there's other areas, but uh, in trying to find the right ways to measure, the right hows in the equation, I think this is an area of flux and of experimentation, a lot of conversation, and we're still trying to figure out the most effective and efficient way, right? I mean, we can't spend too much money doing this, more more money than the value produced. Or at at the same time, we can't keep doing what we're doing in terms of estimating. So the industry has to change. The regulations will make us change. How exactly we're going to do that? We know the targets. We don't know the method. Well, hopefully there'll be some common sense that's applied to this from the regulator's standpoint so we don't get painted into a corner um, with an inappropriate measurement technique or something like that that is required, but you know, ultimately not the right That's That's the, the right industry thing, fear, right? is that yeah. they'll put something uh, as a, uh, a regulation that has to do that it is expensive and, and not effective. And, and, and unfortunately, we have a track record that that happens sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, it sounds like there's there's a lot of good folks working on it. Hopefully that uh, common sense will prevail. You mentioned sort of the the value element of it and the cost. And I know, you know we mentioned nonprofit organizations like uh, the Well Done Foundation, which I know is kind of focused here in the Rockies, mainly up in Montana is where, where they're based, I think. And they've started to help address this issue, you know, raising money to go in, in P&A wells. But, you know, they're not doing it to make money. And the other side of things, you know, we hear about like a cap and trade and other carbon pricing mechanisms that are being considered. And and we talked about this in more detail, actually, in episode uh, 102, and the fact that the API came out endorsing carbon pricing for the first time last year. Do you think that that, if something like a carbon credits or some pricing mechanism, do you ever see this? becoming sort of a profitable venture where a company could go P&A these orphan wells and, you know, these, especially the, the mega emitters to where they're actually getting carbon credits they could sell that would be worth more than the cost of, of doing the work. I mean, is this even a, a viable way forward for this to help gain some traction or is it just going to require federal funding coming down? Well, I have an MBA, but I'm not an economist. So, I, I, but I really believe somewhere in this equation, we need an economic, a positive economic signal for everybody to do the right thing, point in the right direction. So, I mean, you, you talked about a couple that are po- possible. There's another one, part of this responsible gas issue well, that there's been some trades, not a high volume right now, that say if you're a responsible operator and you're certified by a third party, you may get a nickel, an MCF more through the pipeline because some eventual customer wants to pay for greener operations. So that's another possible economic signal uh, that, again, you could take that profit and go back and maybe make some repairs that you wouldn't have done otherwise or plug some wells you wouldn't have done otherwise. So whether it's a tax that you uh, essentially can lower your exposure because you're doing something right, or that's a, a market contract that sends you a signal that 
you can make a profit by doing something right. You mentioned the well done and others. Uh, Project Canary is one of those ESG sort of co- corporations that uh, essentially aren't there just for profit. They're there for environmental and and uh, governance impact. And there are certain numbers of investors that are interested in that sort of aspect. So, you know, that investment uh, part of the scenario may fund, you know, a company to do this for, you know, a, an economic signal. Right now, it is mostly seen as a cost and it's mostly seen as how can I minimize the cost? And it's mostly seen maybe I could avoid the cost from a smaller operator sort of perspective. And that that's not enough incentive to do the right thing. I think it we're in a we're working a capitalist system. We need an, a positive economic signal, however that is, and whatever that looks like. I think it's missing and is needed. I mean, I'm I'm more of an incentive person than a tax person, but um, mm-hmm. whatever it is, you know, I, I think that's that's one of the things that's missing. The Pain Institute just set up a another kind of small thing. It's the group we're looking at. At responsible finance and uh, uh, Brad Handler's there, and he's trying to work on this whole idea of that economic incentive through the supply chain, and you know, it involves pipelines, it involves uh, the the refineries, it involves the uh, natural gas liquids export part of the business. So, so it is a positive signal through the entire supply chain that it's possible. There are we th- we've talked about solutions uh, that, if implemented broadly, I think this is one of the problems that oil and gas operators have right now is every time they cross the state boundary, there's new rules. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they're, they're committed to be compliant, you know, but at the lowest possible cost. Um, and every time they face a new set of regulations, there's probably more cost in order to try to figure out how to stay within the rules. And so, you know, as much as I'm for states' rights in order to try to do this, there, there should be some more normalization, some more standard playing field kind of rules that I think would also help us move forward. Well, I, th- I think you're right. I think there's going to be some innovation, hopefully, in this area, provide some incentives for companies to be proactive about addressing this. Uh, you know, on one hand, I struggle a bit with, um, you know, helicopter money and endless government spending, but, you know, to the extent that that funding that got allocated the the four point seven um, billion dollars actually does go towards plugging and abandoning the identified orphan wells, at least the ones we know about today. Then I think that is money probably well spent at the end of the day. But um, but that's you know probably a conversation for another day in terms of uh, you know fiscal stimulus and the and the pros and cons and all of that. But you know, I think that's a good spot to wrap up and just wanted to ask if there's anything else you want to mention uh, before we do wrap up. Well, just the last thing, I, mean, I think it has to do with training and awareness. And, um, you know, there's a lot of parts of the industry that are waking up to the the issue of greenhouse gas emissions in their operations for, throughout the industry. And there's a lot of activity going on. And I think one of the um, opportunities we have, speaking from academia, as well as you know, this organization that I've had a chance to work a little bit with is Top Energy Corp. Um, you know, the training that they have, I mean, we're condensing this training to online modules. We have the, the Top Corp, which is a subset of that, that that deals with oil and gas regulators. Don't leave them out of the equation. The analytics, I, I, one of my parts of my course is talking about the use of data analytics for environmental operations as well. We can, we can apply all those uh, Python scripts and data visualization tools to help us figure that out too. So educating essentially the entire industry as well as the community. Um, And, you know, the education awareness thing, I think is really important to help us recognize issues and and recognize issues that aren't issues and figure out the right way to all move forward in some aligned fashion. I mean, we're never going to do exactly the same thing every place, but it, that's an effort that I'm really excited about participating in, even in, in my time of life, is is the ability to just get out there and share best practices and go through this. And Minds has given me that opportunity, and, and Top Energy has given me that opportunity to uh, to reach out. No, that's a great point. And to find out more about that organization, that Top Energy Training, it's just topenergytraining.com. Is that the right address people should go to to find out more? Yes. 
Okay. That's great to hear about the work you're doing there and, and getting uh, regulators trained up in the in the same way that a lot of the industry has been trained over years. Because I know a lot of folks, you know, sp- specifically with Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, I know that there's been a big transition within that organization. And now there are a lot of those commissioners that don't have any experience in oil and gas, and they need to gain the knowledge to under- to be able to regulate, since that's their, their mission now, to regulate properly the industry so that they're doing the right thing, you know, that they're achieving the desired outcome. And I think if they don't have that training, there's a good chance that they could go in the wrong direction. So it's great to see folks like you doing good work in this area and hopefully bringing everybody on the same page as far as what's the right thing to do in the industry. And I think that at the end of the day, that's what what both operators and then regulators want to do. And I think if we have the same toolbox and and skill set to to draw from, I think we'll get there better and a better uh, outcome. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged everyone wants to do the right thing. We just can't get too much paperwork getting in the way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time. What's the best way for folks to reach out and uh, get in touch or to find out more about your work? Well, probably my email at the Colorado School of Mines in the Petroleum Engineering Department, James Crompton at mines.edu uh, is a good way, though. The Responsible Gas website under Payne Institute at the School of Mines also was uh, a way of, of looking at all of the research programs that we're doing within this area. So those are two places to follow me. Sounds good. Well, I'll put those links in the show notes. So if anybody wants to, to reach out to Jim or find out more uh, about those initiatives, you can do so there. Thanks again for your time, Jim. You're welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a good day. You too. Thanks.